Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel and today we're going to try and repair this Super Famicom. Uh, as you can see it is quite yellowed and pretty dirty but uh, I'm not too worried about the outside of the case, it's more the stuff on the inside that's the problem. So let me get this thing hooked up and we can check out some of the issues with it. Let's just start out with the EverDrive, so I'll chuck this in and I've got this hooked up by a composite video at the moment. And we can see that the image looks pretty terrible. Uh, the brightness is all out of whack. Uh, there's some weird horizontal waviness to it. And we've also got some random vertical lines appearing. So that tells me there are at least two issues going on here. The poor image quality tells me that the capacitors inside this thing need to be replaced. Uh, if we swap over to RGB, it should look perfectly fine. And that is because RGB doesn't use the onboard capacitors in the Super Famicom. Uh, the capacitors actually need to be built into the cable. So throw our cartridge back in. If we fire this up in RGB mode and swap over the RetroTINK input. And there we go. The image looks near perfect, but we've still got those random vertical lines. So Definitely need to do the capacitors in this machine, but I think those random vertical lines are gonna be a separate issue. So uh, one thing I would suggest if you're using RGB with your Super Nintendo is just hook it up by a composite, see what the image looks like. If it looks terrible like that, then chances are you need to replace the capacitors in the machine. And I'd recommend doing that before they leak out all over the board and eventually eat up all the traces and pads. Anyway. Let's open this thing up, take a look inside. So to get inside a Super Nintendo, you will need a 4.5 mil game bit driver, and there are six screws on the bottom that hold this thing together. And with all those screws removed, the top cover should just lift off, and then we can start pulling out the cartridge eject thingamajiggy. It should just slide out of there and don't forget the little spring on the end. And then we've got a whole bunch of Phillips head screws to remove and this little board at the front, which should just pull out. So let's start pulling out all the screws. And our little switch can be unplugged for now. We'll come back to that later. And with all those screws removed, we should be able to pull out the sound module. These are only on the original Super Nintendo or Super Famicom consoles. The later ones have all this stuff built onto the main board. So you won't find this in a later machine. And we can pull off this little RF shield. And we can also pull out the entire main board, unless I forget one screw. And the bottom RF shield can also come off. Now, in terms of RF shielding, uh, it's up to you if you want to keep these. I generally don't bother. And now we have a slightly better view of our PCB. And speaking of PCBs, I'd like to thank today's channel sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay are a great place to get all your PCBs prototyped and assembled, and they also do 3D printing, CNC machining, and a whole lot more. So be sure to check out PCBWay for your next PCB order or any 3D printing or assembly needs. We thank them for sponsoring this video. So we can see that there is one little capacitor down here, but most of them are actually hidden under this heat shield. So we need to remove this. First up, we're just gonna remove this screw holding the 7805 voltage regulator on. And then remove, looks like there's a couple of screws missing. Remove the bottom screws around the outside of the board. There's usually two on this side and sometimes one or two on this side. And that should allow us to remove our little heat sink. And now we have a better view of all the surface mount caps on the board and straight away I can see that these two over here are leaking. There's sort of crust on the pads on these two caps. 
These ones don't look so bad, and this is where our video circuitry is and the audio as well. These are more power filtering, so uh, definitely need to replace those two, but in general with pretty much every Super Nintendo or Super Famicom, I recommend just recapping them now. I think the caps in these are old enough that they should be considered past their use by date, and these days I just recap all these on site. The first thing we need to do is get the old capacitors off the board. Now there are a number of ways to remove SMD capacitors. People have their own preferences and if you found a technique that works for you and doesn't cause any damage then I say go for it. I'm going to discuss a couple of the ways to get these off and then I'll show which way I prefer to do it. The first and probably safest way is with a pair of hot tweezers. These are basically two soldering irons in one, so they have a tweezer action, and that way you can just get on either side of the caps and heat both legs up at the same time and lift off. The problem with these is they will struggle to remove leaking capacitors. If you have electrolytic fluid that mixes in with the original solder, it seems to raise the melting point of the solder. So you'll need to apply a lot more heat with one of these in order to get the SMD capacitor off the board. The other problem with these is, well, this particular set of hot tweezers. These are Waihua, Waihua 938Ds. These are complete shit and I don't use them anymore because they're just rubbish. They don't put enough heat into the board and you probably end up doing more harm than good with a pair of these. So if you're gonna get hot tweezers, look for a decent brand like Hacko or whatever. The next option would be a hot air gun. Pretty much just heat up the area around the SMD cap until the solder liquefies and then you should be able to pull the SMD cap off. Obviously don't do it with your fingers because you'll probably burn yourself, but you get the idea. And similar to the tweezer method, if the caps have been leaking, you're gonna need to put a lot more heat into the board in order to get those caps off. And sometimes they will actually pop and explode. Uh, pretty much you're heating up electrolytic fluid inside a small metal can. So eventually the fluid's gonna get hot enough that it's gonna wanna escape out of that can and uh, it'll probably do that in a fairly violent fashion. The third method is using a soldering iron and just slowly working it off the board by heating up one leg at a time and basically tilting the capacitor in the opposite direction. I don't recommend this method. Um, you need to put a lot of heat into the board and because you're sort of lifting on the capacitor, it's very easy to rip a pad. So uh, that's the one method that I do not recommend anyone do unless, of course, it's working for you, then carry on. The fourth method is to cut the capacitor in half, basically coming in with some flush cutters around the bottom of the capacitor or fairly low on there and snipping. I'll do an example with this one down here. So the capacitor gets cut in half and then you should be able to lift the remaining bits of the capacitor off the board, which will just leave the legs in place. I've seen a number of people do it this way, but keep in mind that if the capacitor hasn't leaked everywhere, then it can get messy because you're gonna snip open a capacitor that has a bunch of electrolyte in it. And you may be putting some pressure on the pads because as you're cutting into the capacitor, the capacitor is gonna to wanna to sort of bend inwards. So you're gonna be lifting the pads up from the bottom, but it seems to work for a lot of people, so uh, if that's what works for you, again, carry on. The final method, and the one that I prefer, is the twist method. Coming in on top of the capacitor and gently pushing down while twisting back and forth. Not too much, just a slight little bit either way, until you feel the legs break and then the capacitor comes off. Then you just need to remove the black plastic part if it's still there. And obviously you need to clean up the pads and remove the broken off legs. I've had the most success doing it this way. In fact, I've never lifted a pad doing it this way. So I'm gonna continue doing it this way. But again, whatever works for you, I'm not here to tell you how to do this. I'm just showing you the different options. If you feel really strongly about this and think the twist method is terrible and that nobody should do it, feel free to leave that down in the comments. Uh, just be sure to leave a link to your YouTube video where you show us how it's done. So let's continue twisting off caps. Again, I put a little bit of downward pressure and just twist the cap back and forth a few times. I don't go all out crazy and try and rip the cap off. It's just a little bit of downward force and you can pretty much feel when the legs give way. So 
Sometimes you can even hear them sort of click as they break off. And then we just need to get rid of any of these leftover plastic bits. Sometimes they'll get stuck around the legs that are still on there. And you should be able to just sort of get in there with the flush cutters and they should break apart pretty easily. And that is our SMD caps off the board. Obviously we've still got parts of the original legs on there and yeah, these caps have definitely leaked. There is crud all underneath them. So uh, ugh, that one looks particularly nasty. Anyway, let's get the old legs off and uh, prep these for some new caps. So to start with, just to get the old legs off the board, I'm just going to come in with a bit of fresh solder. This is actually a spool of solder that I don't normally use because I accidentally ordered some really thick stuff. So uh, it's kind of perfect for this job. And I just come in with a bit of fresh solder and just sort of apply it around the pad and the original leg. And usually the leg will get picked up on the end of the soldering tip. And then I can just take it off in the brass wool. This one might be a bit tricky because yeah, it's definitely leaked a lot. So it's going to take a bit more heat to get that flowing. There it goes. All right, and that should be all the old legs removed. Now we just need to get this crappy solder off because it's been mixed with the uh, electrolyte and the original solder that was on there. So for this, just a bit of desoldering braid works best. This seems to not only take the old solder off, but it also sort of cleans up the pads. Uh, so. Definitely desoldering braid is the way to go and a decent desoldering braid like the uh, MG chemical stuff works quite well. All right, that's the solder removed. Obviously everything looks pretty nasty, but most of that is just flux residue. So just some IPA should be enough to clean this up. And that is it. And all the pads are looking pretty damn good, ready for some new caps. Uh, this one over here still looks a little bit rough, but then again, that's where the worst leakage was. So I might just go over that one more time with some fresh solder. And don't sit too long on a single pad. If you put too much heat into a single pad, it will come off the board. And you can see a little bit of the solder mask has come off here, exposing some of the copper. Not a big deal, this is all just ground anyway. All right, time for the new caps. So I am gonna be using SMD capacitors to replace these, but you can use through hole if you want. In fact, when I was sort of a beginner, uh, I did use through hole capacitors to replace SMD ones because frankly, I was just scared of soldering SMD caps, I think. Uh, in fact, I do have an old board here. This is now a parts board, but yeah, it does have through hole capacitors where the SMD caps would go. If you're going to use through hole, I'd recommend forming the leads on the capacitor first. So if you lay the capacitor flat on the board and then sort of push the leads down to where the pads will be and then solder it in, you're probably going to have a better success rate than if you try and solder the leads first and then bend the capacitor over. You kind of risk lifting the pads because you're going to put pressure on the pads when you bend the capacitor over. So I recommend forming the leads first if you're going to use through hole. But uh, as you can see, through hole looks a little bit odd uh, when you put them in spots for SMD caps. So I'm going to be using SMD caps from now on. And while we're here, we should remove the big Rubicon cap in the middle. This one is probably still okay to use, but uh, let's just pull it out. We might give it a test, see how it tests. 
I'll worry about clearing up those holes later. Uh, we're seeing 922 microfarads, so it's still within spec. And we have an ESR of 0 ohms, so yeah, probably still could use this capacitor. I've got plenty of 1000 microfarad capacitors on hand, so I'll just replace it anyway, but uh, I'm sure this will be fine to use. Might actually just keep it for a rainy day. Yes, and finally, if you do have one of the SHVC boards with the external sound module, there are two through-hole capacitors in here, I think. Just need to pop this thing open. Yep, there we go. Those two right there. Honestly, I've never seen these leak in one of these, so uh, it's optional to replace these, I think. They are 47 microfarad 10 volt capacitors. Let's see if we can test one of them while it's still on the board, see how it tests. 42.8, that's still within 20% tolerance. ESR is 2.7 ohms. Uh, for such a small capacitor, it's probably not really a surprise. I'm happy to leave them on. And again, the 1000 microfarad cap, this one actually reads 0.2 ohms ESR. Did this one read zero? It does. So the original Rubicon cap may actually be better than my replacement Nishikon VZ series. Hmm. Let's put the Rubicon back in. Right, for the surface mount caps, you can obviously just get the values off the original capacitors. Otherwise, console five have a list of which capacitors go to which board. And I think they also sell cap kits, um, but I did not buy a cap kit through them. Uh, I just got these from Mauser. But um, I, from what I hear, their cap kits are good, but uh, shipping to Australia, I think is pretty expensive. So yeah, cheaper for me to get them through Mauser, but whatever works for you. So let's get the capacitors in place. The way I'm gonna do it is just to tin up a pad on each capacitor on the board here. Just like so. And then I like to come in with some flux and just apply that to both pads. So the one that we tinned and also the blank one next to it. Just like so. And then we get our capacitors. So I like to just take the capacitor with some tweezers and then heat up the pad that we already tinned and slide the capacitor into place. And that worked out quite well. So the capacitor itself should obviously cover up the silk screen marking on the board. And you wanna make sure that the stripe side of the capacitor goes on the flat side of the silk screen. Cool, and with that side in place, I just come in with a bit of solder on the other leg. And that's it. Everything is attached properly. Might just give this side a touch more solder. That um, ground plane there seems to be sucking up all the solder for itself. So let's just wick a little bit of that off. Just so it looks tidy. Cool, and then just do the same for the rest of them.
All right, that's all our SMD capacitors replaced. Uh, one last thing you can do is replace the 7805 voltage regulator. Uh, the original one I think is a one amp version. Some people suggest a two amp version is better and that can also help out with the white line issue, which is where you get a vertical white line down the center of the screen on certain games. Um, I haven't really seen that issue come up with the SHVC boards, but um, I think I will just replace this with a newer 7805. I think I've got a lot of 1.5 amp versions, um, which should still be better than the original 1 amp version, although probably doesn't really make much of a difference to be honest. Anyway, I'll replace it as a matter of course. You're going to be difficult, aren't you? I don't know. You're not. So the replacement I have is a L7805 ABV. I'm pretty sure this is a 1.5 amp version, but uh, again, replacing the 7805 is optional. It may help with the white line issue if you have the actual white line issue, if you've seen it pop up but um, it's not a guaranteed fix for it. Some say adding a capacitor across the output of the voltage regulator can also help. So um, that could be worth a shot as well if you're suffering from that issue. But uh, like I said, I've got a lot of these on hand, so may as well replace it while we're in here. Now, before we go soldering it in, we actually want to put this heat sink back in place. So I'm going to screw this back down. Make sure that's screwed back into place first. So then we can put in our replacement and make sure that it lines up with the little hole there. Uh, you can also put a little bit of thermal paste on the back. I might do that. It's probably not gonna make that much difference, but uh, again, while we're here. Just a splodge of that on there. Get that into place and screw it in. And then solder our legs. Make sure we didn't bridge anything. That looks good. Uh, I'm not gonna bother cleaning up the flux residue because Nintendo didn't bother, so why should I? All right. I think we're ready to power this back on, see what it does this time. So let's just grab the little front panel board just so I can connect a controller to this thing. Plug that in. Uh, we're going to need the switch. And of course, video output and power. All right, let's throw our EverDrive back in. And we get a whole bunch of nothing. Well, that's not good. Let's check that the cart connector looks clean. Looks fine. Let's try that again. Still getting nothing. What's going on? Did I forget something? EverDrive looks like it's powering up normally. I can see the little flashing LEDs going on inside. That looks normal. Uh, let's try our Super Nintendo burn-in cassette. These you can find on AliExpress. They're just a reproduction cartridge of the uh, original Nintendo burn-in ROM. And this seems to have powered up just fine. Huh. Why is this not working then? I'm sure it's just bad contact. Let's give this a good clean. So yes, the cartridge connector does actually come off the board so you can get in there and 
Let's clean it out with a bit of IPA. And of course, clean the connector on the main board. And to clean the contacts on the inside, I just usually put a bit of contact cleaner in there, if I can find it. A bit of this stuff will do, or your um, favorite contact cleaner, lubricant, whatever brand you prefer. Just do a bit of in out, in out with the cartridge. I'll just go over the contacts on here. Make sure they're clean. Ooh, and they are not. This has seen quite the number of dirty Super Nintendos in its time. Let's try that again. We're getting, oh, I know why this isn't working. Doesn't work without the sound module plugged in. The burning cart will power on without it plugged in, but uh, you won't be able to run any tests. So uh, yeah, always make sure if you've got the separate sound module to plug that back in. Right, there we go. So we still have those weird vertical lines. Um, the image looks perfect, but again, we're running in RGB mode. So let's switch over to composite and with any luck, everything should look good, at least for composite video. Uh, So there we go, the composite video, yeah, it does look pretty good for composite, but uh, we've still got those weird vertical lines. So um, next thing to do is go back to this burning cartridge and run the tests that are on it, see if it can tell us where the issue might be. Sometimes it'll pinpoint it, sometimes all the tests will just pass and you'll have to figure it out yourself. But um, with any luck, this should give us some clues, so. Let's hook up a controller and head down to the burn-in test. Let's see what it says. Oh, and we got field flag fail. And it's just frozen. So normally to go through more of the test after this, um, it does like a bunch of graphics mode tests, but uh, it has stopped. And that is where we're going to leave this one because diagnosing this field flag issue took quite a bit longer than I expected. So uh, we'll pick that up again next week, but I thought it best to split up these two videos here with this one talking about capacitors and hopefully not ruffling too many feathers in the process. And the next video we'll get right into diagnosing Super Nintendo issues and uh, it's going to involve some microscope action and some SMD soldering. So I hope you all join me for the video next week. But as for now, thank you all for watching. A huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. And if you would like to become a supporter of the channel, links to that are down in the video description. You'll get ad-free early access. So by the time you're seeing this video, uh, patrons will already have access to the next one. But either way, I hope you join me next week. And um, yeah, thank you all for watching, liking, subscribing, all that YouTube bullshit. I will catch you in the next one. Bye.